new session of the Chilean Probability Seminar. Uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, uh, Theo Asiotis uh, from the University of Edinburgh, who will speak about the exact solution to some interacting particle systems relating to random matrices. Thank you. Thanks uh, for the invitation. It's really nice to, well, it's really nice to be here, even virtually. So let me, uh, okay, so this is one more here. Okay, move now. Okay, so let me just tell you what the talk is going to be about. So I'm going to basically talk about two types of interacting particle systems, which are related to random matrices and are related to each other. I'll try to explain that. And in particular, somehow I related to matrix generalization of these so-called Pearson distributions. So this distribution is like a, kind of a classical family of distributions on the subset of the real line, which include like things like the, the Gaussian, the um, gamma distribution, beta distribution, and so on. And, and you can consider matrix analogs of those and these interacting particle systems somehow um, they form a time-dependent model of that. And some of the main results are some, some nice, well, not nice depends on, I guess it's uh, quite subjective, explicit formulae for the distributions and things like correlation functions and so on. But I will try not to show too many formulae because they really can be quite, uh, quite involved. And this is based on a paper put on the archive about uh, a few weeks ago, like a month ago. Okay, so, because not everyone, I guess, uh, familiar with random matrices may be. So let me start from, oh yeah, maybe I should say that this talk, I will mainly focus on the Gaussian case, Gaussian Brownian case, and kind of survey the results, which are somehow, these are not my results, but, um, and then in the very end, if I, I'll try to explain how things generalize to this general uh, Pearson distributions. Okay, well, I okay. guess. First of all, so what is the um, kind of, um, so we have a Gaussian random variable and now we want to look at the Hermitian matrix analog of the Gaussian. So we want to construct a Gaussian matrix, which is Hermitian and somehow the most natural way to do that is to uh, take, we take, IID real Gaussians on the diagonal, and then we take um, IID complex Gaussians of um, variance one on the off diagonal, and then we get subject to the Hermitian constraint. Somehow we determine this matrix, and this is called a Gaussian unitary ensemble. And uh, equivalently, so I gave you a construction in terms of just put these entries so that they're independent Gaussians. And now we could, um, I mean, we can view this as well as a probability measure on Hermitian matrices, which is given as the following formula. So I have DG is basically Lebesgue measure on Hermitian matrices, which is just, somehow it's just Lebesgue measure, Lebesgue measure on the entries. So on the diagonal, I'll have real entries. And then here we have to split basically real imaginary part. And then we have this Gaussian, Gaussian weight that comes from the, um, the yeah, we weight this, this Lebesgue measure by this Gaussian weight and they have some normalization constant. And this uh, normalization constant, okay, so I denote by Z, you can compute it explicitly. There's some, you have to compute some matrix integral. Um, okay, but it's not, I mean, it's explicit formula is not, it's not important, it's not important here. And there are many things, uh, you can study about this random matrix. Uh, one of them, you want, maybe you want to look at the, the law of the eigenvalues. So, so the eigenvalues are going to be the real, right? So in the real line and their, and their law is given explicitly, given explicitly by following probability measure, which is basically to so have this product of this Gaussian weight and then we have an, an interaction term. So if we didn't have this interaction term, we would have just uh, IID Gaussians, but the eigenvalues interact with each other and somehow they, they, they repel. So you can see that if uh, eigenvalues get close, you get, um, 
you know, this weight is very, is becomes very small. And then this normalization constant is, um, okay, so again, it's, it's, it's explicit, it can be computed explicitly, and it's different from the one above somehow, but I will, in general, just use Z for some normalization constant, which you should assume is always, can always be computed explicitly, but, but it will change from line to line. And uh, okay, so this has many nice properties and so on, but uh, I'm not going to dis discuss them now. And there, and things you can study, you want to study um, like the infinite uh, particle limit and, and, and things like that. And um, okay, so this is kind of the static picture. So we have the Gaussian, kind of the natural Gaussian distribution. On, on her emission matrices and now I want to consider Brian motion. And so what do we do? So instead of Gaussians, we take independent Brian motions and entries. So, so in the diagonal, we take real Brian motion. And then the, the off diagonals, we take uh, this basically this complex, this complex Brian motion, which is constructed by taking two copy, like two independent copies of standard real Brian motions. So, okay, so so we form this matrix, okay, so maybe just go just a back uh, one one step. So instead of this G, you know, this G11, G22, G33, I just put real independent brown motions on here. And on the off diagonal, I'll put uh, complex brown motions, which are, which are independent. And then subject, if you have the, you need to have the Hermitian constraint, so everything has to determine. Um, this brown motion Hermitian matrix and was considered by Dyson in the, in the early 1960s. And then the really nice thing about this is that if you, so if you look at the eigenvalues, so your eigenvalues, so now we're gonna, of course, again, the thing is Hermitian. So they're going to be on the real line, but, um, and then they move in time. So they move in time. And then the really nice thing about them is that they solve a closed system of stochastic differential equations. And I just wrote it down here. So somehow let's just forget the, this interaction drift term for a moment. So, so basically it says this DZI, which is the eigenvalue is, is driven by some prior motion. So you have this N independent prior motion, which are driving this, this eigenvalues. And then, they, and then they interact somehow. And then the interaction is, is given by the sum one over zi minus zj. So somehow if particles get close, let's just think of two particles. So z1 is say z1 is below z, uh, z2, it's going to get a, and they get very close. Z1 is gonna get a push um, down and z2 is gonna get a push up. And then, this interaction is, is gives basically the particles, there's, there's no collisions between particles, almost surely there's no collisions between particles. Um, and then in fact, even, even if you start, so even if you start the, you start the, you know, it's these from some kind of degenerate point, which is all of the coordinates are, are, are you know, are the same, then for any, Finite, finite time, the 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 eigenvalues become distinct. So somehow we get a picture, get a picture like this. Okay, so the eigenvalues repel, and then even if you start from the same point, then they be distinct for for any finite time. And you can study things like, of course, you can consider like a Einstein Olympic version of this thing. You just basically add this kind of restoring drift towards the origin. And then that uh, is going to have um, this Gaussian Hermitian matrix as a stationary distribution. While Dyson Brown motion, is, you know, by construction, at time t equals one, basically, well, because at time t equals one, we get this IID Gaussian, so the correct uh, variance. Basically, this is the distribution at time one so, uh, of this, of this, of this. Um, of, of, of the matrix of the matrix process. And if we look at the eigenvalues at time one, we get back the, we basically a distribution is given by this probability measure. 
So that's um, one thing. And okay, so let me tell you a bit more about the properties of this of this stochastic process. Uh, okay, so there's some equivalent description. So somehow I told you we have this Brownian matrix and we'll get its eigenvalues. So there's one description. Another description with no reference to the matrix is the SD that, that I gave you before. Or I should say, yeah, the SD has a unique strong solution. So this is D. So this is another description. You can just say, you know, this is uh, the unique strong solution to this SD is some stochastic process and it coincides with the eigenvalue evolution of this matrix. And there's also some other descriptions that are closer to the things I'm interested in. So the other one is equivalent description is the following. So, so you take n independent random motions, you take n independent random motions, starts in from locations x1, x2, and up to xn. So I always assume this, 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 you know, this, this locations are ors there. And I like to assume that uh, x1 is less than x2, less than x3, up to less than xn. And then I condition these random motions to never intersect. Okay, so of course this is somehow it's kind of a singular conditioning because this the probability that they never intersect uh, is actually zero somehow, right? So, so if you look just at two independent random motions, they start from locations x1 and x2. Um, the probability they never intersect is, uh, you know, it's, it's just zero. But somehow you can con you still make sense of this conditioning. And the thing you need to compute somehow is to compute the, this asymptotic, so this collision time. So, so you start any independent brown motions from locations x1 up to xn, and then you want to see what's the probability that the collision time is bigger than some t, and that is going to decay as, as, as t, you know, as t gets large, it's going to go to zero, and you want to understand how it decays somehow, and that is, it has been computed. This has been computed, so it has this power basically law of decay. And then the important thing here is that we have, um, this is how it depends on the initial condition somehow. So we have this, this thing, um, this product xj minus xi. Um, oh yeah, I should maybe mention one more thing about this, this somehow this product, this product, you can actually write as a determinant. I should have written it, but I, but I haven't. So this is determinant xi, to the power j minus i. So, so, so the entries of the matrix um, of which you take the determinant is uh, x i to the j minus i. And then if you compute that determinant, it's called the van der Mond determinant. And then you get, get this formula. So, okay, so that's the equivalent description. And then you can get, so using that, you can get an explicit formula for the transition kernel of the, of, of 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 this stochastic process. So you start from locations x1 up to xn and you and you run and you run this this process for time t and then you end up in locations you know infinitesimal locations around y1 up to yn and it's given by its formula. So this so this ratio of these functions we have here so this basically is this dubh transform which is given by the van der Mond determinant and then this determinant is somehow it's called the Carly McGregor formula, which basically basically gives you the probability, the following probability. So you start, um, so somehow you start any dependent right motions, and you want to um, end up in locations y1 up to yn. But if the the right motions intersect, you you kill the process, so you stop you stop things. So that's somehow a sub Markov. It gives rise to sub Markov semi group. And then if you do this dupe transformation, this conditioning, then it becomes a proper Markov semi-group. And then this coincides, it coincides with the, the solution to the SD. Uh, okay, so there, so there, you can study this type of things. I mean, from different points of view, one thing that's of interest, you want to take, so you had n-dimensional SD, maybe we want to take infinite dimensional SD limits. So in the end we have, infinitely many particles and they interact and want to see do they solve some SD and, and so on. So that's one type of question you consider. Another question you can consider is, uh, which is related to something, 
was kind of a tool to prove what's called universality for random matrices is to see somehow you start this Dyson ram motion for you know fixed finite n from you know some initial condition and you want to see how I mean how I mean how fast it goes to I mean it converges to equilibrium. Uh, when I say converges to equilibrium, I consider the Einstein Ullenberg version. So it's why so it's stationary. I start from some initial condition, then I want to see how fast it converges to equilibrium, which is like the Gaussian, and is the is the basically the Gaussian unitary ensemble I showed you at the very beginning. And um okay, but my interest here is more for an exact formula for space-time correlations. And I'm going to view this as a point process. I'm going to try to explain it. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to explain it uh, soon. Okay, so the next slide is a little bit. Okay, so a little bit. Uh, okay, so it's a little bit abstract, but I'll try to be a bit more concrete. So basically, I want to see things as a point process now, at viewed at different times. So somehow, and then I have a space which is going to be some interval L R. So it's gonna be minus infinity to infinity in this case. So this 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 interval is just gonna be the real line, but later it will be useful to have an interval. And this D is gonna be the, some discrete set of time somehow. And um, I I view it, okay, so in some sense I view this, let's just say D is one up to M. So basically I view I have this M, like M copies of this interval. And the, the things I'm interested in are this, conf x, which is basically the set of all point configurations. So it's just collections of particles, if, if you like, collections of points that assume a pairwise distinct in, in, in this um, in x. So this, for example, this is one point configuration. And then, well, I mean, you can, okay, so you can endow this, this x with some, um, well, counting measure times the back measure and so on. Well, let's, okay, so let's not worry too much about that. And then you can put some Borel structure on, on conf x, and then basically a random point process is just a probability measure on conf x. Conf, conf x is just, you know, there's an element there, it's just some finite, locally finite collection of points. And then if I have a probability measure on this thing, I just get a, a random point process. And associated to this random point process, so this basically is probability measure, um, I have uh, have correlation functions. Of course, they're, when they exist, they're basically determined by this formula, which is, is a little complicated, but uh, so I'm not gonna spend any time on it. So I'm gonna go to the more kind of informal description, which is which is the following. So, so informally, we should think of the this correlation functions that somehow density of finding probability in infinitesimal locations around, around these points. So basically, so if I write, so I have this math, uh, okay, so I have this thing, which is this math track xi, which is given by two things, is ni, which you think of the, somehow, which copy of uh, well, this interval, and xi, which is going to be somehow the spatial location. And then this correlation function at x1 up to xn, so it's basically going to give me the probability that this point process um, has particles in locations ni, like in the level ni, and around, um, so around the spatial location xi, and then for i equals one up to n. So somehow, okay, so this is, how I mean, how, how I think of the, the correlation function in this case. Well, maybe I, sh I should have said there, this p, this p is with respect to, uh, actually this measure, is this is with respect to this measure m because as I said random point process I like to think of it as some probability measure on this space of space of configurations so okay so this p here should have been m okay so this is correlation function and then I'm interested in a very very special uh class of random point processes which is called a uh, determinant point process so, so which is the is the following. So we have correlation functions. We have um, you, so you consider this for n equals one, n equals two, and so on. And then the special thing about this determinant point process is that um, this correlation function is given as the determinant 
of a matrix which is determined by a function of two variables. So, so I have this function of two variables from x times x to, to, to complex numbers. And then the determinant of um, the determinant of ij equals one or two n of x i x j. So this gives me a correlation of functions. So somehow the main thing here is that all you know all the informations do you like for, for this point process is, is encoded in this k. So all, everything's encoded in this k. And then um, if you want to analyze things, you want to, you know, take expectations of some, some observable and, and so on. I'm not, well, I will not discuss that now. Or if you want to compute certain probabilities of finding, you know, having no particles in certain regions and so on. So this is going to be equivalent to some quantities involving K, okay? So, so, okay, so this is maybe not, it's not immediately obvious that all, all these things you, we can compute using K, but somehow trust me that in, in the end, everything will boil down to this, this, this function of two variables K. And if I want to take limits and so on, again, everything will boil down into taking limits of, of this function. So, so this is, the main uh, thing. And then I should say, although I, I'm not sure if I'll have time at the end, I should say this, all these things make sense if you consider sign measures of, of mass one on, on, on convex. So somehow the correlation function you can define, but here you have no expectation. You should take integral with respect to M and, and so on. But there's no somehow probabilistic um, meaning, but it makes sense if you consider integrals with respect to M instead of, because it's, it's no longer expectation, but it's not necessarily positive. Okay. And then let me move to the theorem for the correlation of this Dyson brand motion. Okay, so so basically, so what this what does the theorem say? It says, whoops. So, so it says that if I start, I have this Dyson brand motion, which is basically this solution to this SD, and I started from arbitrary initial condition, and um, okay, so it runs for, for some time. And I look at times T1, T2, up to Tm. So look at this picture here. So I start from X1, X, uh, Xn, up to Xn minus one, Xn. And I have some non-intersecting paths and I cut this picture at times T1, T2, up to Tm. And then on each, you know, on each of this, you know, on each of these times I get basically a point process, a random point process on R. And, uh, and then the theorem says that this random point process is determinantal. So the correlation function are given by some, you know, determinant. And the correlation kernel is explicitly is given as a double contour integral. Okay, so I'm not giving you the formula. I'm going to give you a formula towards the end, which somehow includes this one, but it's not exactly in this form. Um, and the nice thing about it is, you know, have this double contour integral and you can do asymptotics and so on. And uh, well, I should first say when was this, uh, you know, when was this result proven? So, I mean, it was proven by, by Johansson in the early 2000s when it was basically um, so, so when one of his papers when he considering universality for, for weak number matrices. And this idea of using Dyson brand motion somehow kind of first appears there. Um, it also appeared earlier, I think, in the kind of more physics literature by Brezin and Hikami. So they also computed it. So this was for a fixed time. So, so somehow they said, you know, start from arbitrary initial condition. And then you, you know, for a certain time, fixed time T or well, fixed time S1 equals S2, just sing, take a single, you know, cut this thing, the single time. Then that point process determinanta with explicit kernel. And then multiple times was done by in the, the 2008, nine or so, around there by Katori and Tanemura. So they have a formula which basically generalizes this point. And you can do asymptotic analysis and you can find what well, I mean, what happens to correlations as you take the n to infinity limit. And as you can, I mean, I'll try to sh show in this picture that gives them different limits you can take. So, so you can focus on the edge uh, here. So again, to focus on the edge. So, so here everything is starting. Everything is starting from zero, so it's kind of an easier thing. But anyway, so so there you can start from um, 
so you can focus on the edge lines. So you have these no intersecting lines or you can focus on things at the edge or you can focus in the bulk and you get basically get different things. So here you get something that's called the airy line ensemble. So you can get a limiting um, line, line ensemble of non-intersecting lines and the correlations are again determinanta and given by some kernel which involves the airy functions. It's called the airy line ensemble. And in the bulk, somehow you get, again, you get some determinanta point process which uh, the kernel involves the, um, it's called somehow it's called the extended sign process because for a fixed time you get something that's called the, the sign point process which is the correlation kernel is given by simple formula in, in terms of sign uh, function okay so this is what's one one particle system so this is dyson ray motion now let me discuss the other uh, particle system i'm interested in okay so this is brownian motions with one-sided um one-sided collisions. So basically, how does this work? So it looks, you know, quite, quite different. So basically, I guess the easiest way to understand it is this picture here. So, so we have, you know, we have N particles, they're all there initially, and all of them, they do, they're driven by some Brian motion. So they're all, you know, independent Brian motions drive them, and they interact only when they hit each other. So basically when they collide. And in that case, the, you know, so the first particle is just Brian motion, doesn't really care about what happens about the rest. And then the second one does Brian motion, except when he hits the first one, he has some basically some local time term which reflects it so, so that it stays uh, less or equal to this one. So, so, I mean, a way to see this is uh, so you run the first one, you get some, you have some just standard Brian motion, and then, and then the next particle is basically. Brian motion reflecting this time dependent interval. So, so this is a you know this is a thing that you can basically reflect some Brian motion of a, of some some continuous function. It just take the function function is random here and it's just given by Brian motion. So you, you do one Brian motion, you reflect the next one of it, and then you reflect the next one of the one you got before and and so on and so forth. And this is called Brian motions with one-sided collisions or reflections, also called Brian and Tasev. And then the transition kernel is actually, is also explicit. Uh, it's not, I'm not giving you a formula here. It's not as, um, it's not as nice. Actually, it's a bit, it's, it's more involved than the Dyson Brian motion. Um, and then, okay, so this was the paper by John Warren where he gets a formula for it, but actually it also appears in, earlier paper by Sasamoto and Wadati, this is somehow a, a formula there as well for, for this part. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so the next thing is, so basically I'm not going to discuss it, oh, well, basically almost at all, but somehow there's another model called Brownian last passive percolation, which is very closely related to the one I just described. Um, Okay, so this is somehow this BLPP uh, function here. We, and it is related because somehow this local time term, you can write basically as a running maximum. So, so, so if you think of reflecting Brian motion, reflecting Brian motion of zero, in that case, somehow the barrier function is just a function f of t is identically zero. And in that case, the local time is going to be, you know, basically it's going to be supremum. So you can write some SD for reflecting Brownian motion. It's going to be, you know, Brownian motion minus supremum S less than or equal than T minus this thing. And then you, you can write an analogous formula in this case for this one. And if you iterate it and so on, you, you get you get this thing for B, B, in terms of BLPP. Okay, but I'm not, it's not going to make a, an, an appearance in the rest of the talk. And the other thing I should say is that what we did before, we did, you know, collisions to the left, and then you can do collisions to the right, basically, right? So instead of taking, do Brian motion, and then you have particles from the right reflecting and, and, and so on. So it's basically just flip, just flip this thing, just flip this sign somehow, and you get this other particles. They're basically, well, they're, they're equivalent clearly by, by symmetry. Okay, and then, let me give you this theorem, which is uh, I think from two okay, so two years ago. So maybe I should, I should okay, maybe I should um, 
So there's previews work for special initial conditions um, by uh, Patrick Ferrari, Herbert Spohn, and um, Thomas Weiss, which is I mean, for a certain number of in initial conditions. And then they do some, they do, they, they can take some scaling limit, but I'll not, okay, so I'm not gonna discuss that now. But some of the most general result, which is start from arbitrary initial condition x1 up to xn, then you can compute the probabilities that the you know the nj um, you know parsigo um, you know index by n1 up to nm is at least some uh, its location is at least some zj. You can compute that in terms of a Fredholm determinant, and that. And that Fredholm determinant here comes something again, some some explicit kernel, which I mean, I haven't said anything about correlation kernels or determinant point process in this case at all. But somehow determinant point process are hidden in the background. And may, I don't know if I'll have time at the end to say anything about it, but somehow determinant point processes are hidden in the background. And then if you have determinant point process, the formula of this sort is kind of it's somehow if you have a determinant point process with this kernel hidden in the background, then, then you get this formula. So somehow the, the difficult thing is to show, you find the structure, determinant structure, and then find formula for this kernel. Um, okay, again, I'm not giving the formula, the formula is, is, is a little bit involved, but it, it is a nice formula, which is given in terms of kind of the two main features, the way I understand them, it's like, it's given in terms of Hermit polynomials and expectations of some discrete time exponential random walk and, and hitting times of that random walk. Um, and then somehow you can do you you can do asymptotics, can do asymptotic analysis on it. Again, I will not discuss that. And then Hermit polynomials are just giving you some like like there's a nice formula for them, also explicit formula as a sum, and the coefficient is a combinatorial formula, but I'll not give that. And then this Fred Holm determinant is basically you should think of it as um well, one definition is is in terms of this Fred Holm, this, this expansion, this series expansion. So this is some, so this is some, um, you this some integral operator acting acting on this, on this space, and again somehow because I mentioned asymptotics and so on, um, you know what we are interested in asymptotics of this probability, and then this kind of boils down, and of course, the many many you know things you have to do do very carefully and just can be very challenging. It boils down to asymptotics of, of this of this function of this kernel. Um, okay, so this is the result that um, so somehow this is again this kind of exact solvability result for this particle system. And uh, next slide, maybe I should have a very quick uh, aside for to discuss its TASEP, which as I said is basically very closely related to Brownian model. Okay, so I guess. Most of you familiar with taste of taste of probably most of you know taste of better than I do. So somehow, so this is so we have particles on on Z and then just jump to the right by one at some rate one, but they have exclusion constraint. So somehow, so the picture here. So we have particle here wants to jump to the right. There's no particle, so it jumps fine. It's no problem. But if this one jumps, so if this one has exponential clock rings and wants to jump, there's another particle here. So this is, this is not allowed. And then associated to this particle configuration, you can have some kind of height function. You see, you know, if you see a hole, you go down and see a particle go up, you see a hole go down and see a particle go up and so on. And then somehow you have to fix, somehow you have to fix a certain point, it takes a certain value. And then is, um, you can go from particle configuration to height function. And from high function to particle configuration, and this this basically is model under Poisson process to Brownian motion scaling. We get back the Brownian model I showed you before, and somehow the previous theorem is um, there's an earlier result which is kind of a breakthrough result where it was proven somehow this TASEP was was solved in the explicitly in the sense that. In, in this sense that you can get an exact formula for probabilities of this sort from any initial condition. Again, there was a, a lot of a lot of previous works that I'm, I'm not, um, well, I'm not discussing here. Indeed, a lot of previous works with um, 
for special initial conditions. Uh, okay, but in this in this paper from a few years ago, the a formula was found for for this probabilities, this type of probabilities for taste uh, in terms of a function of uh, the correlation kernel, which is a little, you know, it's, it's some similar structure, but, but it's different. It's like uh, things are discrete there. there. And then under this KPZ scaling, you can construct the KPZ fixed point from, 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 from TASA somehow. So, so you can rescale this function appropriately and, and so on, and you converge to this uni expected to be universal um, Markov process, which is somehow it's determined by by its transition probability. So so it's some you start from some initial you know initial initial function, and then you have um, so what's the distribution of this random function at time t? And you can write things explicitly again in terms of fraton determinants and some some kernels, and, which is okay. I'm not I'm not gonna give you here, but again this is um, this type of formula is, is what characterizes KPZ fixed point. And I should say it was also shown in, in, in the, the previews in this paper, in this paper here, that if you somehow rescale this um, one-sided reflecting brown motions, you also get, get to KPZ fixed point. Okay, so up to now, I've discussed these two types of interacting particle systems. So the first one comes from an matrix that's very, it's kind of obvious. The second one is not so clear where the, random matrices are coming from. So I'll just give you, so the connection between, between these particle systems, so it's the following. So, so we start this Dyson random motion from zero. So there's no intersecting particles. And then we also start this, you know, this prime motion with one side collisions from zero. And then the result is the following. So, so the, so the distribution of the lowest or particle Dyson Ram motion is the same as the lowest particle of uh, Brian motion with one-sided collisions to the to the left. And then the high, like the biggest particle of the Dyson Ram motion is, is the same in distribution with uh, the one-sided uh, re reflecting Brian motions to the right. Okay, so this is, and then so this gives a connection between these two particle system to random matrices through this Dyson Ram motion. Okay, so this is not, I mean, it's not obvious why it should be true, but actually you can couple these two types of particle systems and you can see then it, it, it becomes, you can couple them and then it becomes kind of clear. And there's a coupling which is related to the RSK correspondence, which is in this paper by O'Connell and Yor. I'm not going to discuss, and I'm going to discuss a different one. So to discuss this, so we have, okay, so to be a bit, uh, you know, a bit brief here. So we have, I will discuss this thing about this interlacing array. So what is an interlacing array? Do, it's basically- Do you have a small question? Just sure. for, yes, yes. For, for, for the result before, this they are not jointly in the same law, no? It's just the- No, they- so they can. The, as I mean, so so if you look at the parts, the e, not the whole is somehow not the core z one up to z n, only the extremal mm -hmm. particles. But not the extremals together. The extreme, the the extremals together, actually, yes, yes. Okay, so it, so it's the pair is equal in lot to the pair. So yes, yes. So, so basically, the extremal particles to, together, yes, yes. And it was it will see from. I'll I'll try to explain. Yes. So. Thank you. So somehow, okay, so the way to couple them is, is somehow the following. So first of all, we want to consider this thing called an interlacing array, which is basically, I would say this configuration interlaces, they satisfy these inequalities, which you should look at the picture. So basically this particle is between these two, this particle is between these two, this one is between these two and so on. So the configuration on the top interlaces with the one below it, if, if you have basically one particle in between. So, so that's the interlacing, uh, what, that's what interlacing means. And you can consider that, you know, this interlacing arrays where you have configurations which interlace. And then you can consider some, some SDs in the interlacing array. And it's just given, it's basically given each particle is a brand new motion, except when they collide with a particle on a lower level, 
they just reflect to keep the order in. So if you do, if we just do three particles, so so one of them is just brand motion. The green particle is just brand motion. So let's just, uh, and then the other two interlace with this one initially. And then we solve basically brown motion with reflection in, in, in this time dependent domain with um, the time dependent domain is given by the green function, which is a Brian, is Brian motion. So somehow it's the same thing as, as before. So this is basically one of, you know, one side is Brian motion with reflections uh, to the left one, the other one is Brian motion reflecting to the right. And then you can keep doing that. Okay, I mean, it's very, very hard to, you know, do the picture here now, but um, so it's good to just think about this three particle picture. And then this is the theorem. So the theorem is that, so consider this as these, so these are brown motions, except you have this reflection to keep them in this interlacing array. And then it says, so top row, you pick it according to the initial condition, and then they pick the rest of the coordinates uniformly on interlacing arrays with that top row. So basically, if you take interlacing arrays with a certain top row, and then the rest of the coordinates, you pick them uniformly, basically you have the Lebesgue measure. So that, that thing has certain volume that you can compute and it's given by its formula here. And then just, um, and then subject to the interlacing constraints. So somehow this is the distribution you use, okay? so. You, Pick the top thing with any probability measure you want, and then the rest is, is uniform, which is corresponds to this, you know, basically this measure here. Then this theorem says that the projection on the top row, which is a priori interacts with the others, the projection on that is actually a Markov process, and it's given by the isomeric motion. And then, and then, okay, so there's something else here I'm not going to discuss, but let me just give go back to this picture. So basically what this says is that we have this three particle process. We pick the green particle. So we pick, so the red particles can start from any distribution you want. And you pick the green particle uniformly and random between them, right? So it's uniform. And then you run this dynamics. So the green does round motion and the other ones reflect. And then if you forget the green particle, just project on this two, then this is Dyson round motion. And then, Somehow this is a coupling because in this particle system by construction, like the edge, this edge particles, let me just go back again. So this ones are one-sided reflected Brian motions. This ones are one-sided reflected Brian motions. And the theorem says that the top is distributed as the isomeric motion. So that's, that's how you get the, Somehow that's how you get the result. And then say here, this boils down to something called the some criterion for when a function of a Markov process is Markov itself, right? So, so here we have a Markov process initially, you have this Brian motion with interact with simple reflections. And then we want to project on the on the on the top row. So this is taking a function of this Markov process. And then and then the question is when, when is it actually Markov process itself? And there's some criterion. Which is kind of very non-trivial to check, and in general, it's, it's um, I mean, in general, it's, it's you know, it's very hard to you know to, to say whether a function of Markov process is Markov, but it does it does work in this case. Okay, so basically, that's the connection with this to, to, to particle systems, and in fact, I'm not explaining it here. This type of result gives a connection between the transition kernels of the two particle systems. And in principle, gives certain you know connection between the two theorems that I showed you for very you know very special initial conditions only for the on, only basically for for one particle, but beyond that, uh, the connection between these two theorems is not um, it, I, as far as I can tell, you cannot go from one to the other. Um, okay, so then so this is the Brownian case. And now let me tell you, I guess, what I've done. So how much time do I have, by the way? Uh, like, like 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, that's very good. Okay, that's good. Okay, so, so, okay, so we did the Gaussian case. And now the, the whole point is that you, you can actually, this very, very similar structure, although some things, some things do not work as nicely. Uh, when you consider these Pearson distributions. 
So this Pearson distribution are basically uh, the densities. So you have some, you know, dense probability density on uh, some, you know, some interval LR, let's say, and it solves this differential equation, which is says the following. So differentiate in M, uh, like in X, this thing, and then you get back M times a polynomial of degree one on the top, a polynomial of at more, excuse me, of at most degree one on the top, at most degree two on the bottom. So, so in the Gaussian case, you get differentiation, you get like minus X or I think my minus X. So, so you get, you know, the at most polynomial of degree one on the top, and then here you get constant. So just polynomial of degree zero. And then there are the distributions which you know fall into this framework, like all the very nice distribution, like gamma, Cauchy distribution, and so on. And then associated to this, you know, associated to this thing, you can consider some one-dimensional diffusion, which is given in LR, which has a generator. Because basically you can write the generator in this form. And when I say associated to these, I mean it might have this M. As well, the probability measure corresponding to density m is it's in unique invariant measure, or it can have that as a fixed time, you know, fixed time marginal, like Brian and Motion and Gaussian, or or Ornstein, Ullenbeck and Gaussian, in which case is somehow the invariant measure. And then I'm assuming here boundary points are inaccessible. So L and R. So if you start in the state space, you never reach L and R. So so that's uh, uh let's, okay. so that's a kind of a nice assumption. It excludes some things, but not you know not. Too, too, too many. And then in general, all these things, they have explicit transition density. So, okay, I mean, in the case of the Gaussian, you get the heat kernel. Ornstein Ullenbeck, of course, you get a slight transformation of the heat kernel. And then other things you can consider are um, square Bessel process, where you have basically you have 2x here. So, so somehow this is zero, this is zero. And then here we have 2x. And then you have b1 is zero and then you have something that's called the dimension of, of uh, it's going to be here so basically a square Bessel process is somehow the squared um square norm of multi-dimensional Brian motion and it solves some you know, it solves the closest d it's a Markov process and has a generator and it's been, been studied a lot and this it lives in as long as, as long as the dimension as long as this drift there's a constant here so as long as that drift is big enough uh then this never reaches zero if you start from an inside zero infinity. So in that case, the zero boundary is, is inaccessible. So you cannot, uh, but, but we can start from zero. So that's a proportion. And as I said, this explicit, the transition density is always explicit, but um, it can be it can be a bit involved and it's given in terms of hypergeometric functions and, 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 and things like that. But I'm not, I'm not giving you any, any formula. And, it, it looks it can be look a bit different in certain cases than, than others okay and then just write uh, write this a of x so this way okay so that's the one dimensional picture so now what's the matrix picture well the matrix picture is before we had this gaussian gue matrix her, her mission analog of the gaussian so somehow you can consider um basically her mission analog of this Pearson distribution. So you define in this way. So you have the, this Lebesgue measure on Hermitian matrix normalization concern. You have the weight. And of course, okay, so here I'm a bit, you know, I'm not very I'm abusing notation somehow because MH, somehow H is a matrix, MH is again a matrix. But what I mean here is just mean this thing. I should, if I was more careful, I should be written like is E to the trace of log MH somehow. So this is, um, uh, you know, these are some non, non something non negative numbers. So this is a so basically before I had a Gaussian weight, now I have a more you know more, more general weight, which works for all these Pearson distributions. Well, I should say this Pearson distribution have been uh, basically well I've been studied for in statistics and the things like that for, for many years, also mathematical finance, and. Um, and somehow, I mean, Pearson introduced them, and that this corresponding diffusions were introduced by Kolmogorov in like the nineteen, at some point, I think, in the nineteen forties, and so on. And and the people are interested in these areas, like statistics, math, finance, because you can compute a lot of things explicitly. Because as I said, there's explicit formula in terms of hypergeometric functions and things like that, and you can compute things explicitly. 
because in general, you, you know, arbitrary one-dimensional diffusion, the transition density is is not explicit. I mean, there's some spectra expansion and things like that, but things are not explicit. Okay, and then this includes all the so-called classical ensembles of random matrices. It includes the Gaussian, the so-called Naguerre, Jacobi, and Cauchy, which are basically given by this when M is, is, is given by this, uh, somehow this formula. So in the Gaussian case, you have Gaussian here, the Laguerre, you have this, you know, gamma weight, Jacobi is the beta, then Cauchy is this, this type of thing. And then if you look at the law of eigenvalues, you get, you get this sort of, uh, you get this sort of thing. So again, so instead of Gaussian weight, you have same interaction as before, but you have a different weight here. So, so really, I should say you, the, the, I just got lost with what type of M can you use here? Uh, the is type this, of M you can use here is the one which is uh, can solve, uh, it will can solve, this, it can solve the equation, of course. It can solve this equation and then um, can be normalized, uh, can be normalized to be probability. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, and then this is the law of the eigenvalues of this matrix model. Okay, and then, well, so, so what is the analog of Dyson Ram motion? So you can, again, do transform this independent things by this Vandermond determinant, get some SD, again, it's non colliding, you can show this. And then there's a, there's somehow you can write some matrix process in the background which has this as eigenvalue evolution so 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 it's a different type of thing so so somehow we have you have some sd in uh you know in this interval to, to the end there's non-colliding and so on and then again you can have a transition kernel which is explicit so qu quite similar to before here, this const n uh, before this was zero in the Brian case. Here, here was a hit kernel, but here we instead have the one dimensional diffusion transition. Density. So the structure is, is quite similar. Okay, so in the theorem, so the theorem is this one. So basically, this is the analog of the theorem of uh, Johansson and Brezin, uh, Hikami, and Katori, and Tanemura. Basically, if you consider this, this dynamics. You just start from arbitrary initial condition, then um, then this is determinanto. Okay, so this is actually this is not so. It's kind of it's not difficult to to see using results in the area that it's determinanto. But the thing is that you can get a formula for the kernel, and and the formula is given is this one, which basically boils down to the previous formula. If you know that this. Um, that this type of thing, okay, so this looks a bit weird because this is negative time, but I will say, I hope I'll have time to say one thing at the end about this thing. You can consider, you know, can consider the same group in a negative time, as long as you apply it on polynomials, this is, this is fine. And then this has some contour integral expression. And then you get, um, you get back that formula. I should say also Z here. So this is, um, okay, so this is analytic in, in the in, in in the complex neighborhood of uh, of this interval, basically, so I just want to contour it and circle all these points. I should say it's possible to give a formula without complex analysis, but but it's a bit uh, it's you know, it's it's not as it's not as nice. Okay, so this is theorem one, and then and then what is the other model? So the other model is now Pearson diffusion with one sided collisions, which is generalized as this Brownian model. Uh, okay, so here we have, you know, again, so if you forget this local time term, you just have independent Pearson diffusions. But here you have to change a little bit, you have to change a little bit the drift. So the drift, again, it's going to, de it is somehow again a Pearson diffusion, but the drift changes a little, but I'm not, I'm not going to discuss that. So somehow if you keep the same B everywhere, the model is no longer, is not, as far as I can tell, cannot be solved in this way. And then again, so, so basically what this is, is just take one of Pearson diffusion and then you run it and then you solve an, another one in this time dependent domain with this reflection. And uh, it's basically exact analog of the Brian model. And again, there's an explicit transition kernel which is more, is more, more involved than I'm not showing you here. Uh, and it's more involved than the Brian case actually. And so again, the, the theorem is, um, 
you start dispersing the fusions from some arbitrary initial condition, and then you get an analog of that theorem I showed you before, where you have, you can write this probabilities in terms of fragment determinant of some kernel, which is explicit. So you can do that in general. However, the form is not, in general, is not as somehow, it's not in, in, as nice in the as Brian case. However, you can get something as nice in, as in the Brian case. So the formula I, uh, whoops, the formula I have here for the Brian case, you can, it boils down to the previous result. I can show that. But also in the square Bessel case, which is somehow the next nicest, uh, if you like. Of course, the Ornstein Lundbeck is very close to the Brian, so it's, I wouldn't, I don't really count it. So in that case, the kernel can be given in terms of expectations of the same exponential random work that I mentioned before. And now instead of Hermit polynomials, in principle, also Laguerre polynomials can, uh, can appear, but I'm not, okay, I'm not just okay, discussing this. Instead, you, you have the transition kernel square Bessel diffusion of negative dimension, which is, uh, so basically it's a square Bessel diffusion, which is has a negative dimension and hits zero, it's uh, it's it, it's killed. So it's, it's, an, it's a sub Markov transition kernel, but there's a, it's a somehow has a duality, so you can get an explicit formula for it. Um, so basically it's an analog of the or the formula for Brownian motions. And there's a okay, so there's a formula for uh, you know for one side collision in the other direction. Okay, let me give you a final theorem. Well, the final theorem is the construction I show you, the construction of Warren that uh, works in uh, Brownian motions in the interlacing array. You can do the same thing for this Pearson diffusion. So, so you can consider them in the interlacing array. And this basically gives a coupling between the interacting particle systems at the edge, which are the ones with one side of reflection, and the things on the top, which is according to this theorem, it's going to be non-colliding Pearson diffusions. And then the, the result is basically so somehow what holds more Brian motion holds in this case as well. Uh, this kind of a probabilistic result. So in terms of kind of probabilistic result, everything works. In terms of explicit formula, things are more, actually more involved. And I mean, okay. I haven't had time. Yeah. Just a question. By Gibbs initial condition here, you mean starting at the origin or something different? Uh, no, I mean the... here, start the top from any initial condition and then there is uniform. Ah, okay. okay. So, so this is okay. kind of structures. So, so, so yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Okay, thanks. Yes. And then, okay, so that some special case for, for this one was uh, this kind of probabilistic result was some special case we've known before. Because, and as I said, this gives a relation between these two semi-groups, but... Uh, uh, Okay, I mean, it doesn't give a relation between the theorems as far as like, I mean, it does give for special case, but it doesn't in general. And I should say, it's an interesting thing is that this RSK related construction by O'Connell and Yor, which was later, um, later I mean, heavily developed by O'Connell in, in like directions related to things like quantum total lattice and, and things like that, which are kind of different models and there's um, get interesting connections there. That type of construction, which somehow, it, that construction only involves n Brownian motions instead of now I have n times n plus one over two because every particle has independent Brownian motion. That construction doesn't, as far as I can tell, doesn't work in this for, for this matrix, random matrix model. It only works for that Brownian, Brownian motion. Okay, and then, I don't know, ideas or the proof. Uh, okay, so, so maybe I'll go super quickly just to, okay, starting point is that, you know, for the explicit results, uh, well, it's the explicit formula for the transition kernels. And then and then in the one side the reflecting uh, case, we have some relation between, you know, I plus one and I, I particle transition kernels. Because as I said, as I mentioned very quickly, I changed it. I changed this drift has to change a little bit, has to change a little bit from, you know, uh, line to line. Of course, in the Brian case, this thing, it doesn't change at all because it's, it stays the same. Um, and then, so if you do that, then it's possible to rewrite this distribution at the fixed time as a measure of interlacing arrays given by product of determinants with some structure, you know, the, the, you know, the thing that comes in the determinants as a structure. And then from this result, you call the ANR meta theorem, you get determinantal point process structure, but the kernel is not explicit yet. So it's given implicitly. 
but you 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 know you have to do something and then for the non-colliding diffusion model you get determinant structure immediately essentially immediately from this theorem because you know the transition kernel is a very nice form somehow it's very nice form so you get that you get that immediately but again the kernel is not yet explicit so you have to do something to get it explicitly and somehow in both cases to get the explicit kernel you need to solve some a bar orthogonalization problem which is equivalent to inverse some matrix or so, so, you know, it's equivalent to some, some other problem that you must solve. And this orthogonalization problem is different in, in, in one model and the other. So it's, it is different. And basically the bar orthogonalization problem, which is again, I'm very easy kind of simplifying a lot. Like if you're looking basically at a single, let's say single time in the case of Dyson Brown motion or um, single particle in the other one, Basically, you have some data which is given some functions that are given as data, and then you want to find polynomials. The reason is why polynomials again comes from the problem. I'm not explaining, which are biorthogonal to its functions. And then this psi i, so this psi i involves time t, of course, and the initial condition is hidden in there. So it depends on some way, this the initial condition. And you have to solve this, and it's it's not okay. I mean, it's not obvious how to do that. And um, well, the thing is, okay, so this thing is this backward in time diffusion flow of polynomials, which is kind of interesting thing, thing in itself is that, so, so if you have, you know, in general, you can define this for this Pearson diffusion, you take some polynomials and you apply this thing for, for it, even imaginary type, you can apply this as, you, as this series here, okay? Of course, this has a definition when T is positive, it's just the integration with respect to the, you know, transition density. Um, and then this thing much, this thing's much. I mean, so so basically you apply to polynomial, get polynomial back, you, you can actually, you know, it's not so difficult to see because somehow derivative drops one degree and then you multiply and then you get polynomial the same degree and so on. You just have to show the coefficients are fine. And then, and then the thing is, so from the initial condition, this X, this general initial condition, which is here is the difficulty somehow, you construct some polynomials. And in the non-colliding case, these polynomials are very nice, very simple, actually. They're just basically polynomials with polynomial with roots at the initial condition. And then essentially, if you flow them somehow back in time, if you like, with respect with with in, in, in this, you get this phi i's. So, so the thing you want to find is given by this um phi i's. And as I said, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm gonna finish on the next slide, is that this this in in the Brownian case, in the square Bessel case, this you can give some integral expression for, for this thing, even for you know negative times. Because okay, for positive times, you have integral expression with respect to transition kernel, but in general, it's just defined in this way. But but for Brownian motion and square Bessel, there, there is some contour integral formula that you can you can write, but uh, in general, it's not so clear to me what, the, what is there, but. Okay, so I, final comment about this backward. Well, maybe I'll say that in the next uh, slide, which is my final slide. Is, okay, so the outlook. Okay, so the scaling limits, that's kind of obvious question. I think it's an interesting question. I haven't discussed it at all. And then the other other interesting question is some connection to integrable systems. So, so these probabilities, which, as I said, like for one point correspond to some probability of uh, you know having let's say not having I, like the maximum particle of Dyson Brown motion being less than something or bigger than something corresponds to some matrix model not having eigenvalues in some interval. This this these are known to be connected to differential equations like Pan-Levé equations and so on. Again, it's a very interesting question. What happens? I, I it's nice. Interesting to investigate. And the final thing I want to mention is this backward in time diffusion flow polynomial is actually very interesting. And it has appeared in other areas, um, also very recently, some conjectures about, about this backward in time diffusion flow, so how, how it relates different up the matrix model in, in the case of Brownian motion, so it's in the case of the heat flow. And it would be interesting if there are other, like if you consider Pearson flow. Does there is are, are there any analogous applications and, and 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 so on? Okay, so I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Theo. So before questions, I propose that we unmute ourselves and we give a round of applause. Uh,
uh, and are there any questions? I have a question. Yes. Aurelio? Yeah, yeah, go. Ah. I, 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 I didn't, I didn't oh, think you needed my authorization. <laughs> no, I mean, I, there was no reaction. No, just a quick question. So I guess this backward mm -hmm. flow on polynomials, it only works for these special type of diffusions? Of exactly, exactly. Yes, because somehow if you- so if special you... about it? Well, the thing is, so somehow it's well. So, so somehow it's different. Okay, so let me let me go on here. So you look here. So, so in the case of the heat flow, somehow this is gonna terminate, right? So it's gonna drop the degree. But uh, in 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 general, I want to when I apply L to some power, you know, apply L L K times this polynomial. I want to get a polynomial back, and I want to get a polynomial of at most the same uh, degree that I started with. And somehow it's almost, you kind of have to have things like this because somehow, you know, if things grow faster as well, you need to have like, you know, for these SDEs, you need to, um, yeah, you need kind of linear growth and, and so on. So if you consider something more, more general, I'm not sure what you, maybe you can consider more general polynomials. That's a yeah, I was question, thinking. but again, you need some, conditions somehow to be but but indeed you need some polynomial things there otherwise i don't i don't see okay. and one in, another comment i should say is that um kind of related to these recent conjectures that come from this heat flow is that you know you have this polynomial and you evolve it according to this to this heat flow so the the, the roots are going to you start so deterministically and they satisfy some differential equation and this differential equation is actually this one if you somehow remove just forget the noise and then you kind of you, you somehow you have to okay so there's some minus sign as well but somehow the evolution of the roots which is the deterministic is basically differential equation which has appeared in other somehow other areas as well in the brownian case it has been studied in the brownian case but not as far as i can tell not in these other cases so okay so because somehow we, i think we lost you for a couple of seconds and I, oh, okay so so, so, the, so you say the roots of the polynomials and yeah the so the, you take flow. the polynomial with z with roots x1 up to xn and then you apply this heat flow mm -hmm. or this kind of diffusion flow and then the, the evolution in, in time of these roots, because they're not going to evolve in time, so it satisfies some differential equation. And that differential equation is going to be basically that, yeah. forget, the SD, forget the noise, and it's yeah. just minus that thing. And this differential equation actually has, has been studied and appeared in other areas. There's something that's called Newman's conjecture in number theory at uh, Tau and Brad Rogers proved a few years ago, and they kind of study this differential equation as it appears there, and it also appears in some other conjectures and random matrices. That's interesting. And, yeah. Okay, so that was a kind of a side uh, remark. No, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, are there any other questions? I have a quick extra question. So in the oh. in okay, I don't know if what I'm gonna say is correct, but I think there's some versions of RSK for half line polymers or something like that. Uh -huh. like, yes, yes. By Nikos Ziguras and, and yeah. some other people. Yes. So would you expect those to be related to I don't know the Laguerre case or something? Uh -huh. Possible, poss but in, in somehow in a different, I think somehow in a different way. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. But in terms of somehow the construction that comes from the RSK when it comes to these interlacing arrays, that construction only involves uh, n Brownian motions that are driving this. Mm -hmm. so in this case, you have n times n plus one over two. So the so I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if it's going to be related to, I mean, I, 
It's a bank. It's a bank. It's a bank. Clear to me. Uh, first. Okay, but, but I, I, I guess one might hope that in those special cases there is some version of RSK which makes the coupling. I mean, yeah, okay, that's a very good question. Whether well, it's an RSK version which gives you the coupling for Laguerre. Yeah, that's a good question. But as far as I know, I mean, back to one of the PhD students with Neil and John Warren, I mean, that's something we discussed at the time. And I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think, yeah, it's not clear. It's not clear to me that there's a version of RSK which would give this, this coupling with interacting square bezel with reflection and non-colliding square bezel i mean that'll be interesting but it's i don't i don't i don't i don't know yeah that's what i'm asking i have no idea. <laughs> it, it sounds okay uh, thanks yes so are there any other questions so if not i propose uh, that we thank uh, uh, theo again And now we can pass to the informal part of the 